How about we check out a little something here from our boy, the fire electrician. There was this latest video that's been recommended to me on angry old veteran versus 700 red coats. So we're talking about the American Revolution this time. And I do not know who Samuel, Samuel, well, so Whitmore is, but uh, sounds as like a very interesting character if he can hold off. 700 men. Let's give it a look. Ah, uh, yes, the official state hero of Massachusetts. <laughs> Today we're talking about Samuel Whitmore, quite possibly America's first anti hero and the most gangster old man of all time. But first, a word from our sponsor because this video is brought to you by Operation Good Boy. They make all kinds of dog related products from supplements to treats to toys to dog poop picker upper bags. And Mushu absolutely loves the Made in America treats ready to eat. Jake? I'm still impressed by him calling his dog Mushu. Roll over. Roll over. Come on. You got it. No, do the whole thing. You got to do the whole thing, dude. Roll over. Roll over. Roll over. You're making me look bad on camera. Roll over. Fine. So yeah, check them out at operationgoodboy.com. Use the code QUACK15 for 15% off. Let's get back to the video. All right, Samuel Whitmore. We don't know much, but here's what we do know. He was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1696. From there, he goes dark. We don't hear from him until 1721 when he gets married to his wife, Elizabeth Spring. Then he goes dark again. There's nothing of him in the historical record until 1744. At the age of 48 years old, he would fight in King George's War. And during okay. that war, he held the rank of captain, leading an entire platoon of dragoons during the Siege of Loisburg. If you don't know, Dragoon oh. is just a fancy word for cavalry, so think of like Malfoy's dad from the Patriot. Same thing. So that's <laughs> cool, whatever, but here's the important part that nobody else ever brings up. Like I said, he's a captain, which is a way bigger deal than most people make it out to be, and here's why. There's really only two ways that you can become an officer in the British military at this point in time. Way number one, you family. were born into a wealthy British aristocratic family, and daddy's got a lot of money. That's yep. like 95% of the you. British officers at this point in time. Or way number Number two, and way, way less likely, absolute you are a complete badass. badass doing gangster shit on the regular, and they absolutely need you to lead some men. Given the fact that Samuel's just some random colonial that was born in Massachusetts, it kind of narrows down which category he fell into. So mm -hmm. he and his men help lay siege to Fort Lewisburg. That goes well. They take over the fort. From there, the war is over. So he heads back home to what is now Arlington, Massachusetts. From there, he goes back to doing seemingly the only other thing he's good at, because I'm not kidding you, this guy does two things his entire life. He plows stuff and he fights wars. When he's not fighting wars, he's back at home plowing his fields and plowing his wife because this dude has 10 kids. I am not kidding you. There was only two things on the historical record that even proved that this man existed for the next 10 years. One is the sheer amount of birth certificates where he is listed no. as the father. I mean, the mother is always his wife. He's not cheating on his wife. It's just they're having a bunch of kids. Yeah. And second, and my most favorite detail of this entire story, when he came back from war, he had a very, very decorative, ornate, almost gaudy French officer sword covered in gold and rhinestones and jewels and all kinds of shit. And it became his prized possession that he would show off to all of his buddies in Sheesh. town. And when they would ask him where on earth he got that, the only thing he would say is, and I quote, the previous owner died suddenly. <laughs> I acquired it. All right, so fast forward. I took it from his cold dead corpse. For 10 years. Plowing. <laughs> And a wife. And Attila the Whitmore over here is approximately 58 years old, and the French and Indian War breaks out. Now, does Sam have to go fight this war? Absolutely not. He is a 58-year-old man in the 1700s when the life expectancy is 60. He should be killing over any minute now, but he also has 10 kids, so he's literally like, um, mm -hmm. honey, I gotta go beat up the French again. Okay, bye. <laughs> gotta make that money. <laughs> If you don't know, the French and Indian War is basically the Kingdom of France versus the British Empire, and both sides are backed by different Native American tribes. This yeah. is supposedly the war that Mel Gibson's character fought in in The Patriot, and presumably where he got his cool tomahawk from. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did Sam Whitmore get a cool tomahawk too? No, no he didn't. But what he did get was two matching dueling pistols that were super cool. And you're never going to believe this, but the previous owner died suddenly. <sighs> Okay, look, it's not stealing if they don't exist anymore. That's just the rules, I guess. <laughs> so Sam and his men beat up on the French yet again. He acquires some fancy dueling pistols and then he heads back home. Okay, fast forward again. <laughs> 
Yo, hold on, hold it is on. It's 1763, and Sam Whitmore is 67 60, years yeah. old, and the Pontiac Rebellion breaks out. Surely, he's going to sit this one out, right? Absolutely oh, Hell he no. He grabs his French sword, he grabs his double dueling pistols, his musket, and he heads off to war yet again. So he goes, he fights in that war for a little bit, comes back home, at which point he decides that he's going to get involved in politics. So somewhere along the line, he starts rolling around in the political circles. He finds himself at a fancy dinner party, and there's this guy there that's running for House of Representatives, and his name is John Vassal, and he represents everything that Sam hates. Sam is a small town farmer that's just trying to plant his crops and bang his wife, and this guy is like the big powerful merchant out of Boston, the big city, running the ports, making all this money. He wants to get into office to make make laws more beneficial to him so he can be rich and Sam is just trying to get by. So at this dinner party, Sam, who's not scared of anybody, informs him, hey, by the way, you're no better suited for office than the horse I rode in on. By the way, my horse's name is Nero. He's parked out front and he's not worth five pounds, which I'm not an expert in translating old timey colonial speak, but it sounds like he's saying it you're not worth the horse's ass. Go fuck yourself. At which point, John Vassal gets very upset and decides that he is going to sue Sam for public defamation for the price of 1,000 pounds, which is a shit ton of money back then. That's the equivalent of the Cassius Clay situation. <laughs> Suing the person just for defamation like that. But you forget that you are dealing with an Assassin's Creed level character. Dude is rocking two <laughs> dual pistols and a shiny sword. Don't mess with that. So the entire town finds out about this lawsuit and they all show up to court to actually watch the trial because Sam represents that grizzled old man that's just saying what's on everybody's mind, but nobody else has the balls to say. And he goes in and basically turns this entire trial into the roast of John Vassal, ends up winning, Sam doesn't get sued, at which point he slaps him with a counter lawsuit on the spot and ends up counter suing him for $200 and wins. <laughs> so that kind of launches Sam's political career. Fast forward again. <laughs> it is now 1765 and the British Empire has been fighting France for quite a while and it's getting expensive. They need to make more money and the best thing they can come up with is the Stamp Act. Basically, yeah. they're going to charge the colonials a tax Here on we go. every single printed piece of paper that they come up with. This is like it the modern day equivalent thing of ever. every time you made a phone call, sent a text, or visited a website, you had to pay a tax for it. And people are absolutely outraged and Sam is infuriated. I mean, from his point of view, he's been fighting the French for the British Empire and now he's gonna have to pay an extra tax just for doing it? He is so mad that he ends up becoming a hardcore revolutionary. But he's also like a 70 year old man. So he's mostly just serving on committees being like, hey, maybe America should be its own country. We shouldn't pay so much in taxes, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward again. Oh no. It is now 1773. Samuel Whitmore is a 75 year old man. Oh, 75. And the British government has just rolled out their new and improved strategy. Wait, you were 69 before, but I guess. Yeah, sure. ...for making even more money, the Tea Act. Yeah, they're going to start taxing the importation of there tea, we go. which will Boston go down tea in history party. as one of the greatest ideas of all time. Now, at this point, Sam is serving on a committee representing his hometown of Cambridge, which would later become known as Arlington. And that committee sends a response to the British government in regards to the Tea Act that basically says... Fine, if you're going to charge us more money, we're just not going to buy your tea because, and I quote, if we fail to assert our rights, we will dwindle, dwindle into supineness. Into now, like I said earlier, not an expert in translating old timey colonial talk, but it sounds like Sam and his committee just told the British government that we're not going to buy your metric leaf water because we're not going to let you guys fuck us. That's why. At this point, pretty much everybody in America is pissed off. They start smuggling tea to avoid taxes. The Boston Tea Party happens December 1773. From there, people just start stockpiling guns and gunpowder and supplies, getting ready for war if yeah. one should break out. Now, fast the forward to April 1775, coming. General Thomas Gage is appointed the military governor of Massachusetts, and he will be residing in Boston, which has been turned into a British military stronghold. At that point, General Gage decides, hey, you know what? I'm going to get proactive. I'm going to stomp out this whole rebellion talk right here and right now. I'm going to take 700 men, an entire regiment, and I'm gonna march them out to Lexington and Concord. While they're in Lexington, they're gonna arrest those stupid, annoying revolutionaries, John Hancock and Samuel That's Adams, and then they're gonna continue marching to Concord where they're gonna burn down all the stocked up military supplies. So and therefore, they had to send messages all around 
those cities to warn them that the Red Coats were coming. The British military starts making preparations for a huge movement, at which point revolutionary spies find out and they decide to let everybody know. And when I say they decide to let everybody know, I mean a silversmith from Boston by the name of Paul Revere is going to take off at midnight, ride through the entire countryside, going house to house, telling everybody that the British are coming. And guess whose house is between Boston and Lexington? Sam motherfucking Whitmore, that's who. I'm not shitting you. It is like 99% sure that Paul Revere showed up at 78 year old Samuel Whitmore's <laughs> house sometime in the middle of the night and was like, hey, just letting you know, the British are coming. At which point he's like, get off my lawn. <laughs> then presumably Paul Revere is like, okay, whatever. I got to go warn everybody else. And Samuel goes back to bed that morning, April 19th, 1775, the British are marching and they're almost to Lexington and they are cut off by 77 Minutemen led by a man by the name of John Parker. John Parker orders the Minutemen to quote, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have war, let it begin here. So the British roll up with 700 trained professional soldiers and tell these 77 Minutemen, literally farmers that just picked up whatever guns they had around and told them, disperse you rebel scum. At which point the Minutemen are like, Nah, yeah. we're good. We're going to stay right here, and so are you. And that's exactly what happens. They just stand there staring at each other from across this field with the British officer not knowing what to do because he has to get to Concord to get rid of these supplies because those were his orders, but he also doesn't want to open fire on these guys because that will mean the start of the Revolutionary War. Occasionally, I will watch some of those, uh, either the Civil War or whatever, uh, Revolutionary War uh, reenactment, and they are freaking hilarious, especially when they have to do that standoff, just staring at each other. Some just trying not to laugh because they know what's going to happen, <laughs> hyping each other up. So they just stood there, seemingly forever, in formation, ready to throw down, waiting for the other guy to make the first move. And suddenly from the American side, a gun goes off. Nobody knows who fired, nobody knows why, but this was the shot heard around the world, the world. that would start yeah. the American Revolution. And for all we know, it could have been some old farmer that just dropped his gun. <laughs> From there, all hell breaks loose. Both sides fire on each other. Eight American Minutemen are killed, and the British advance towards Concord. The surviving Minutemen take off to go tell everybody that the Revolutionary War has officially begun, as the British spend the next four hours searching through Concord, gathering all the military supplies and lighting them on fire. Everybody in the surrounding area sees all the smoke from the burning supplies, and they think that the British military is burning down the entire town of Concord. Because of that, 2,000 Minutemen show up to fight back, at which point the British are like, oh shit, and they start retreating. They run across a bridge and start ripping the planks off of it as they go, at which point the 2,000 Minutemen and 700 British soldiers fire upon one another from either side of this bridge as the British continue to retreat. The British now have to march 18 miles back to their military <laughs> stronghold in Boston in their stupid high-vis red coats, and every single American with a gun between there and Boston is taking pop shots at them from the wood line. During yeah. this retreat, 26 red coats go missing, 175 are wounded, and 73 are killed, and three of them at least are from Samuel Whitmore. So we cut back to Samuel Whitmore. He's 78 years old, chilling at home, presumably plowing something. What? We don't really know. <laughs> oh. Because here's gunfire going off in the background, and it's getting closer and closer. And then he remembers, oh, that fucking kid woke me up last night in midnight, told me the British were coming. Maybe that's what's going on. So he goes, he grabs his fancy French officer sword, both of his dueling pistols and his musket, and he goes out to the main road that the British would be marching past. And he's going to stand by the stone wall next to the main road and just wait for the fight to come to him like the complete badass that he is. At this point, all the younger men at men are running up to check on this old man like, hey, what, what are you doing? You shouldn't be out here. And if you are going to try to do this kind of stuff, at least go out in the wood line or in like a second story. Go back home and drink your prune juice, old man. This is not a fight that you need to fight. Window to hide yourself like the rest of us so you don't get yourself killed. To which Samuel Whitmore responds, and I quote, If I can only be the instrument for killing one of my country's foes, I shall die in peace. Which I think we can all agree is gangster as fuck. <laughs> At this point, this man is literally the living embodiment of old man's strength. He's just that old, grizzled, veteran Viking that's got one more fight left in him and wants to die in battle so he can go to Valhalla. <laughs> so he stays there, he loads his musket, he loads his pistols, and he waits, and he waits, and finally the British come marching right down the road 
dead at him. As they get close, he crouches down behind the stone wall with his musket and waits until they get to point blank range. And that's when he pops up over the wall, aims his gun. I said, get off my lawn now. And fires, immediately killing one red coat on the spot, drawing both of his pistols, killing two more red coats, drawing his sword and charging into over 500 soldiers on his own. He is then immediately shot in the of face. Course. He falls to the ground and is somehow still alive, so he reaches to grab one of his guns and start reloading it, at which point the British run up and stab him with bayonets somewhere between six and 13 times. Apparently after the first five, they all kind of blend together. He is then clubbed in the head with the butt of a rifle and left for dead as his body lays there mangled and lifeless as the British continue to march through the town on their way to Boston. Dang. Four hours later, the townspeople notice that his corpse starts moving. So they pick Samuel up, they get him over to the doctor, they alert the family, the family shows up to the doctor, at which point the local town doctor, Nathaniel Tufts, is like, how? The dude is 78 years old. How? He wasn't prepared to handle a fall down the stairs, let alone getting stabbed 13 times and shot in the head. Okay, like there's no way this old man's gonna make it. But Freaking old man Logan strength here. He refused to die. <laughs> he literally is too stubborn to die. Like I said, his family members start showing up, and guess how many direct descendants Samuel Whitmore has at this point in like time 100. after all that plowing? Go ahead, give it a guess. Say it in your head. Okay, you got your number? Okay, he's got 185 <laughs> living descendants, okay? He's got five generations beneath him. He's got kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, great-grandkids squared, and great-grandkids cubed. 185 <laughs> people showing up to the doctor like, hey, save grandpa. At this point, poor Dr. Tufts is like, I, dude's gonna die, but I'm not about to tell 180 grandkids that, so I'll try my best. So he does what he can. He bandages oh, him up great. and sends him home with his family, and they take care of him for the remainder of his days. And when I say the remainder of his days, what I mean is, let me check Two my months. notes real quick. Uh, I mean that he passed on February 3rd, 1793. This motherfucker lived for 18 more years and passed away at the age of 96. And to commemorate Samuel Whitmore, there's actually a monument where he made his last stand. Huh, you said that he was 78 during his last stand and 96 when he died, and that clearly says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Why yeah. are you so dumb? Huh. Okay, look, I understand your point, and I also can kind of sort of read, and I realize the irony because this is literally written in stone, and I'm telling you that it's wrong, but it is wrong. That is the only source that says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Every yeah. other source says that he was 78, and 96. This has been proven to be false multiple times, but they don't want to change it because the monument's already so old. Yeah, that's how it is with monuments, though. In the same way that how some of the more controversial statues uh, are put out of people who literally demanded not to have statues of them made. But yeah, they're still there because some people are clinging to it. So... Yes, I'm sticking with what I said. But the most important part of this picture is to actually zoom in on the house in the background. That's Samuel Whitmore's original house where he lived his entire life. And it's still around today as a historical site in Arlington, Massachusetts. And that monument is in the front yard. So if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, what I'm trying to tell you is in conclusion, this has been the story of America's first and oldest gangster, a 78 year old grizzled veteran that woke up on the first day of the American Revolutionary War and decided to casually go three and zero while telling the entire British Empire to, to get, get off, off his, his lawn. Freaking Thank lawn. you for watching. Best way to support the channel is to buy some merch <laughs> over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. I've never been more excited for a future t-shirt design. I can see it now. America's original gangster, get off my lawn. Samuel Whitmore with two cross dueling pistols and a sword. It's going to be fantastic. That's dope.